All right, so my talk is entitled uh, Automating That, that Other OS. Um, and as Michael said, I work for Chef. I'm an engineering manager there. And I'm, I, I, I titled the talk Other OS because it's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, right? Yeah, sure, I started um, as a Linux administrator. Um, does anybody remember Slackware back in the day? We had actually, I didn't have it on CD-ROM. I had it on floppies, which you had to then, like I downloaded them off a 9600 baud modem. I think I stayed up for like three days downloading everything just to get disk set A so I could install the kernel. Um, but I also administered Windows as well. Anybody remember this? I love this logo, by the way. This is awesome. Like, logo has never been better than on Windows NT 351. And NT was great, right? Dave Cutler. Dave Cutler invented v, um, VMS, right? Dave is an awesome person. NT is like a pretty cool, pretty cool technology. Um, and so how did we manage our Windows boxes before, before automation? Um, maybe some of you folks, this is how I managed my Windows boxes, right, when I was actually doing this as my job. You have MMC, you go in there, it's a nice tree, you click around, this is how I add users to Active Directory, right, drill down to their OU, find where they should go, put in their, you know, you open up that dialog box, it's got like three levels of tabs and all this stuff, and you put in all their information, and then presto, you have a user, right. And Microsoft also gives some pretty good tools for for being able to administer systems. And if you, even if you don't necessarily know all the ins and outs, they have wizards, which are, which are kind of neat to learn about stuff, right? Configure your server wizard. And this sort of thing persists um, through today. So I just installed the tech preview of Server 10. Has anybody installed it here? Had a look at it. Have, no, have you noticed the start menu is actually back? Like back, back for real, not back fake as in Windows 8.1 back, right? If you actually cl click Windows, it actually opens the menu just like it was like all the way back XP, which I think is awesome. But you know the server manager persists as a thing uh, all the way through to presumably Windows 10. Presumably it's going to ship with, with the server manager. So the issue with trying to administer systems like this by pointing and clicking and using GUI is that it's very difficult for this to scale, right? Um, it was all well and good. Like I started as a sysadmin over 15 years ago. And uh, it was all well and good. You know, when you had six machines to administer, you could like point and click at them and that, and that was great to, to apply patches or whatever. Then we got into sort of larger data centers. We started buying maybe cheaper boxes. We got more boxes. We bought, you know, more boxes with less redundancy maybe. Because, um, you know, if one fails and that's okay, it, you just, you know, take the rest of the load. Um, and so it starts getting crazy and unmanageable when you're, for example, you're in the cloud and you have, say, thousands of systems, or tens of thousands of systems, or for some companies, hundreds of thousands of systems, all doing the same thing. Like, how do you, how do you configure them all consistently? How do you even patch them? Now, maybe in the 90s or the early 2000s, you could throw humans at this, right? And some of our customers do that. So Patch Tuesday comes along, they're running a Windows fleet. And literally, I've talked to customers where what they do on Patch Tuesday is they call up, they assemble their entire system administration team, you know, like 200 people, and they each, each of them open up 10 or 20 remote desktop sessions. And then when somebody fires a starting gun, they all go Windows update, Windows update, Windows update, Windows update, Windows update. And then they make sure like nothing goes wrong, right? But this is kind of a crazy, like you're kind of solving a technological problem with, with humans, right? Um, and so I think Microsoft actually recognizes very early on. So if you look at some of the work that, that Microsoft has been doing in the research arena with um, Jeffrey Snover is the fellow that wrote um, PowerShell and has worked on the PowerShell stuff. He wrote this, this document called the Monad Manifesto. It was actually back in 2002, right? And he laid out the world that Windows was in back in the day. There was really no, no command line interface other than you know, effectively an MS-DOS window. And he laid out a series of things that he thought would, would um, you know, serve the future, right? for how you could automate and use Windows boxes if you were deploying a large fleet. And so this has sort of set the direction of Microsoft and how Microsoft has thought about automation in the intervening, um, well, 12 years now, right? Um, so there's some components in this that you'll see have become real products in the Windows world. So the Monad shell is what we now know as PowerShell. Um, the Monad automation model and some of these other things are like the command language that's in, Power, that, that's in PowerShell, uh, the commandlets and things like that. So Windows actually has um, quite a good story, quite a long story around automation generally. All right, so all the way back to, you know, Jeffrey actually worked on WMI um, in 1996. And then remember, does anybody remember services for Unix? Maybe not as much of a success um, in 1999. And from those lessons that learned from when he um, shipped those products, that's when he wrote the Monad Manifesto and thought, you know, there's a better way that maybe we could do this stuff, right? Um, building on the lessons learned from Unix, where you have a shell that you can send, um, you can send commands through as, as a, you know, a text pipe, 
you know, the PowerShell is an object-oriented shell where you can send objects between different stages of that pipeline. So I started exercising this a little bit, obviously with PowerShell 1.0, it took some time for this to, to get up to speed um, and for this act actually to be implemented. And then in 2008 was when PowerShell 2.0, um, which is a pretty usable version of PowerShell, and Server Core came along, which is another kind of direction that you see the Windows ecosystem moving in, where you know you can imagine a world where there's Windows without the Windows, right? Without actually things that you, you log into and push a button and click a, click in a GUI. Um, 2012 was PowerShell 3.0, um, where there you know obviously more commandlets and things like that, and then PowerShell 4.0 introduced desired state configuration, which I'll get into a little bit later uh, in this deck. And what I want to point out in this timeline, obviously, like, I'm a pretty bad graphic artist, so this isn't to scale, but I tried to put the lines close, closer together near the right side of the deck because you can see that Microsoft is moving to a model generally where they're shipping a lot of the automation uh, features and parts that go into Windows independently of the actual operating system. So no more do you have this, like, three-year cadence between launching operating systems, right, between 2008 and 2012, for example. They're shipping things a lot quicker, and I'm hoping that eventually Microsoft will be able to even continuously deliver, perhaps, their, their operating system. So all this to say about automation generally is I think the, the days of logging into a GUI and clicking around um, with stuff on Windows is, is kind of dead. And this is written, um, this quote is, I, I looked up for some sort of supporting quotations that I could, I could use for my talk. And this article um, was written by Don Jones, who's a, he's a pretty well-known tech author in the Windows community. He's actually written something like 45 technology books. Um, and he wrote this article in Redmond Magazine in 2011. And he said, the GUI's not dead, but it's dying on the server OS, right? You're always gonna have a GUI on your desktop for your applications and things like that. But so as a Windows administrator, as a Windows developer, anybody that's working in the Windows universe, don't be caught off guard in terms of your career and your prospects when this, when this GUI is actually gone, right? Bit a bit controversial back in 2011, but I think these, the fruits of that are really coming to bear, right? Especially with a lot of the new features that, that Microsoft is launching on, on, Microsoft, on the Windows platform that I'll talk to in a little bit. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what, what is declarative configuration management. This is a talk, so I work for Chef. This is not necessarily a talk just about Chef, right? Chef is an is a, is a instrument by which I'm going to illustrate some of these concepts, obviously, because I work there. But it's, this is more of a survey about automation generally on Windows and what the landscape looks like and how you can actually accelerate your business and have it operate faster by automating. What are the various options? So declarative configuration management um, actually, you know, one of the speakers, um, Walter, talked about CF Engine has been around for 20 years. This notion, the scientific theory, has been around for, for over 20 years. But basically the idea is that instead of writing um, imperative statements for what that server should be configured as, you actually just write a model for your, for your infrastructure, right? So you describe what that system is supposed to look like. Um, and not how that should be done. So to con contrast, if you don't know the difference between imperative and declarative, it kind of looks like this, right? Like if you were to install IIS on a Windows machine, let's say it had PowerShell, the imperative way to do this would be you would say add Windows feature, right? You'd call some PowerShell command to go and do something. A declarative um, approach would be, this is actually a fragment of desired state configuration, is you're simply writing a document that says, I don't care how you go and do it, how you actually execute this, but what I want is I want my web server to be present on the system, right? You as a system, you know, as the framework of running on the system, you take care of the rest, right? You take care of fulfilling my, my instructions, my desired state. So this is basically the idea behind Chef. Chef is a domain-specific language that is platform neutral, so it's not just about Windows. But you can see that, you know, the, the same syntax looks pretty similar on both if you're managing a Linux machine or if you're managing a Windows machine. So in either of these situations, what I'm doing is I'm standing up a web server, right? And so if you stand up a web server, like what are the things you need to do? Well, you need to make sure that the web server packages are installed. You have, to, you have some configuration files or, or whatever to configure the web server the way you want. And then you want that web server service to be started. And then if, you're, if you reboot the system, it's going to be started at, you know, at system boot. So some of the things are different, obviously across from you know, a Linux uh, environment to a Windows environment. Like Windows doesn't necessarily doesn't have a package manager, it has roles and features, and you can install MSIs and things like that. So you're using Windows feature instead of package, like you would on the Linux side. Um, it doesn't have configuration. You could maybe configure IIS through the registry. I haven't done that here, but I want to make the examples kind of match up. So you, know, you maybe make some configuration file using a template. 
and then the services are just going to be named differently, right? So on, on if you've managed a Unix or Linux machine, it's going to be HTBD on Red Hat. And on a Windows, the IIS service is called W3SPC, right? But you can see that this, this language is portable across any kind of operating system variant, right? So we support Solaris. As, as Michael mentioned, I also work on AIX as well. So, you know, there's primitives that are, that are translatable, like services, packages, things like that that are translatable across, across operating systems. So Chef, um, what, we, what, what, this, what we call this is basically a recipe, right? So you can think of that metaphor as actually quite natural, right? When you're, when you're cooking, you go through a recipe and you, you, know, you start at instruction one and say, assemble these ingredients, chop this, whatever. And so we're actually you know, cooking up an, a web server here. And so these recipes in the Chef world, they go into um, data structures called cookbooks. And the cookbooks contain not only the recipes themselves, but any other ancillary artifacts that you need to, to make that recipe work, right? So for example, some of those configuration files and those templates would go in that cookbook as well. You take that cookbook, it's a distributable package, it's an artifact, it goes onto a chef server, and then what happens is the nodes under management check in periodically to that chef server and get the policy, right? Get the list of things that they're supposed to run, what we call a run list. And the important concept to, to recognize here is that if there's no changes to be made, then Chef doesn't, doesn't do anything. So it's a test and set operation, right? It tests to see if your system is in the state that you want it to be in. And if it's not, it will reset that system state to be the desired one that you specified in that recipe. This is what's known in configuration management as convergence, right? Your system converges to the state that you, know, you stated to this policy, if you will. So the general purpose of declarative configuration management is obviously to have consistent and reproducible configurations across your entire fleet. So you can imagine running the same kinds of recipes or code in all your environments, all the way from dev to QA to acceptance to production. So this eliminates those kinds of that class of errors where, oh, the developer says, oh, it worked on my machine. Right? I don't know what's wrong with your production machine. That's like some other environment, right? If you're all working from the same song sheet, if you're all running on an identical environment, identical, identical configuration that chef, is, you know, that chef is managing, then you ensure that you have fewer errors when you actually go to deploy to production. So through this kind of a workflow, you can manage hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of machines uh, correctly. And you can also use this to deploy applications correctly as well across, again, all those different stages of your pipeline. And basically, the bottom line is, this is like a policy management system, right? It's like a compliance system. You're keeping your systems in compliance with what you've declared as your policy, which is what's on that run list for that, for that machine or those class of machines. So when I talk with um, Microsoft folks, I often get asked, wait, so what about System Center? You know, System Center is Microsoft's answer to configuration management and sort of systems management, right? Is that, is that true? So just a quick review about what System Center is, if you've not used System Center before. So System Center is a suite of, well, I guess Microsoft is branding this the integrated cloud platform, which I find a little strange, but okay. Um, it's a suite of, of system management products that do a lot of different things. And you can mix and match the products. And so Microsoft sells it as a suite. You get all the parts. You can use any of them that you want. Not every enterprise is going to use all the parts, right? For, for example, if you're not running virtual machines and Hyper-V, you're probably not going to be using VMM. Um, and some of these components have been acquired from other companies and things like that. So they work, they work together okay. Um, some parts work together better than, better than, better than others. Uh, but one of the main components in this is what they call Configuration Manager or System Center Configuration Manager. Um, and System Center Configuration Manager, back to the NT days again, when I first started with NT, um, this was called SMS, Systems Management Server, in 1994. And then in about 2007 or so, they renamed this component to be SCCM, System Center Configuration Manager. And the, idea of SCCM is that it manages, and I use the word manage in, in air quotes, because manage means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? It notionally manages large groups of systems that run Windows, Windows Embedded, OS X. You can even use it to manage Linux or Unix machines. It's got lots of different components and things that you can do with it. So, if, for example, if you're running a help desk, you can use this to remote into people's desktops and see what they're doing um, when they call to complain about stuff. You can use this to integrate with WSUS so you can um, deploy patches to Windows machines. 
Um, you can also do arbitrary software distribution. So if you have MSIs like Firefox or Chrome or whatever it is, you want to distribute to your end, end users, you can do that. Um, you can also do bare metal deploy using MDT, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Um, it also collects all the hardware and software inventory of all the stuff that's on your on your system, right? So you can drill down through this GUI and see, well, how many machines are running, you know, McAfee version, whatever, with this virus definition version, whatever. And of course, you can do system configuration. So what's kind of good, bad, and <laughs> ugly about SCCM? So, you know, it's still a, it's still a GUI, right? Um, so the good thing is it's very comfortable for people, right? It's got a very rich GUI, it's very easy to use. You drill down and it's very intuitive for you to, it's got a really easy to use UI. It's got lots of functionality within that UI. So it's actually really great. Um, you, can, you can give it to, it's very good for a PC support kind of use case, for managing desktops, right? Um, because folks who maybe don't necessarily know a lot about server administration, they can still manage a large fleet of desktops with this and, and, very, and with all those remote control capabilities and things like that that I talked about. Um, it's very easy for them to, to use this GUI in a, intuitively, right? And there's also a great integration with the rest of the system center suite of products. And the, the bad side of it is, well, if you're using a UI, you're kind of back in this whole, it doesn't really scale that well um, model. It's a very prescriptive workflow, right? You're kind of locked into the GUI. It's the GUI or nothing. Um, it's a point and click. The other thing is like it needs Active Directory, so that may not be usable for some use cases. Um, some folks, like for example, if you're in the cloud or if, even if you're ha you have machines in a DMZ, um, as an admin, you may not want to run AD in that DMZ. In that case, you're kind of out of luck, can't use SCCM. It's very hard to automate the automation, right? If you make changes to SCCM itself, the global configuration of what you're doing in SCCM, it's not really a versionable thing. It's not like there's a database or what, well, I guess there is a database, but it's not like a versionable thing that you can easily automate how you make those changes to SCCM. And the other thing is that there's not really like a notion of a versionable artifact. There are server baselines in, in SCCM, but it's not really a thing like this is the version of this change and I'm promoting that change between environment to environment. So to kind of compare and contrast SCCM and declarative configuration management, SCCM through compliance settings, I guess is what they're calling it now in 2012. So you're making changes via UI and a point and click workflow. Um, it's got primitives, right? To be fair, it's got primitives for I want to do, I want to make WMI calls. I want to read stuff from WMI. I want to write stuff. Um, you, can, you can programmatically change the registry. You can execute arbitrary scripts on the system. As I said, their notion of an artifact is a baseline, a system baseline, so you can apply a baseline to individual machines. Um, the workflow is very restrictive. There's this notion called item potence. In mathematics, item, item potence just means that when you do something, if an item potent operation doesn't have a side effect. So like, what, you know, like multiplying a number by itself, you can apply, or multiplying a number by one, right? you're gonna get the same number. Like nine times one is gonna be nine, no matter how many times you do that operation. But nine times two, if you're multiplying an integer by two, that's not going to be not going to get you the same result every time, right? You're going to nine times two is going to be eighteen times two is thirty six, and so on and so forth. So you're responsible in SCCM for ensuring this item potence yourself, making sure that whatever you're doing doesn't have the side effect. Um, and then it's also agent based, but Chef is agent based as well. Chef is a declarative configuration system that configures stuff via text files, like I showed you before with that recipe. It's also got similar kinds of resource primitives that you might expect to see on Windows systems, right? Like managing files and templates, registry keys, packages, executing PowerShell scripts, what have you. It's got a little bit of a better notion of a shareable and versionable artifact, like I said, um, with that cookbook. You can run different versions of cookbooks in different, on different machines in your environment, so it allows you to promote your code um, just like you promote your application code from dev to QA to UAT to production. It's got a much more flexible workflow. So people say maybe too flexible because um, we have workflow discussions all the time in the community. It's got that built-in item potence that I mentioned before. So it's because it's a convergent system, it's doing a test and then a set. So most of the operations that you're doing has a built-in test operation. So you don't need to worry about that, right? So Chef is just going to do that test before it tries to set anything. And again, it's also, it's also agent-based. So hopefully my demo will actually, let me just break out of the PowerPoint for a second here. Uh, oh, what did I do? That's okay. What I'll do is, where's my mouse? 
Azure doesn't let you name your computer names longer than 15 characters, and I think I named it longer than 15 characters. So what I'll do is I'll just go to the backup plan, which is just to show you the, because if I do this again now, it's going to take another 10 minutes. So I'll just show you the, the screenshots that I took of the demo running earlier. So the demo of what I'm going to show is um, how you provision machines, well, I'm using Microsoft Azure because we're talking about Windows here, right? Um, how you might provision a new machine from scratch on Azure. And it's basically what I was doing before with that giant command that said knife, blah, 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 was, well, I actually already did step one ahead of time because I uploaded all my content to my chef server because um, I wrote all that content first. And then what that knife command was doing was it was doing steps, basically steps two to four. So request a VM from Azure, right? Contact the Azure API, get me a machine. Azure goes and installs the Azure agent on that machine, which then subsequently installs Chef. That Chef agent then registers with the Chef server and downloads all the content. Um, and I, I specified in the command line the content that I wanted to run, right? I wanted to stand up an IIS website um, which is called Fourth Coffee. If you ever use like Microsoft's example content, they've got a Fourth Coffee website that shows like a very simple ASP.NET application. So what we've done is um, just kind of hijack that a little bit, and then basically, you know, in about ten minutes, you should have a machine that you can connect to, and it's got IIS running on there with this website. So that's kind of what this looks like, right? So if I actually named my machine with less than fifteen characters, this is kind of what it would show, and you can kind of see. The, the things like I'm, this, there's no trickery here, right? I'm using a generic Windows image and a generic VHD off Azure that has nothing on it, right? Um, and I'm bootstrapping using a cloud API. I've got to specify a admin username and password just as you would if you went to the Azure control panel. You click through, you need a username and password that you're going to set. Um, and then the name of the machine. And then this dash R, this last, this last flag up here with the role. I like to run my Windows system with a certain base policy, so I like to have certain services turned off and turned on. I like to customize it a little bit with like background information and things like that. And then I've got a role that will stand up my, my fourth coffee website. So as you can see, the steps that Azure goes through is it gives me a machine, tells me what the, user, what the uh, endpoint name is, right? what the machine name is, what its IP address and the size of the VM and all this stuff. And then it goes on and then, like I said, it installs its own agent, which then goes and installs Chef, because I asked it to do that, and then it, try, it provisions that, right? So it goes and installs IIS, drops off my content from my website, um, and then after about 10 minutes, it'll spit out some more information saying, that's great, here you are, your machine's in the, all set up, and then you can connect to it, and presto, you've got, a, you've got an IIS server up and running. So this is our version of the, the fourth coffee website, so you can enjoy some delicious cookies cooked by um, I think it was actually our CEO's wife that made us chef cookies last year. Daughter. Daughter? Okay. So the code for this is what you might expect if you were to set this up by hand, right? It's, it looks like it's a domain-specific language. It looks a lot like plain English, right? So no more of this, hey, I, here's a run book or some instructions in a wiki um, that get out of date with respect to what reality is. Because this is actually the code that you're running on your systems, right? You know, as long as you're making changes through this system, the code serves as its own documentation for how that system is supposed to be set up. So in order to install this fourth coffee website, first I need to install IIS, and then I've got a whole bunch of prerequisites that I need for ASP.NET before I install it down at the bottom. And because Chef runs, every, runs everything in order, just as you would as a sysadmin or a developer, right? it's very natural for you to specify things in the order that you expect. It wouldn't work if you specified some of those dependencies out of order. right? Now normally, if you have an application, you'd probably get it off some kind of artifact server or download an MSI and install it. But for the purposes of this demo, I just had the files directly in this cookbook where there's not that many. It's a couple of CS, CS HTML files and DLLs and things like that. So I'm just dropping them off. I'm just copying them into the INET pub directory. And then once that's done, I can stand up my IIS pool, uh, my app pool with a, with a certain runtime version, and, uh, and then stand up my IIS site. So as you can see, nowhere in this, in this content am I actually saying what commands to run. Right? I'm not saying dism blah, 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 or add remove Windows feature blah, blah, blah to do any of this stuff. Right? I'm simply declaring what the state of the system is. And Chef's job is to translate my recipe, my, my desired state, into the commands to run on the system and then check to make sure that the policy is the way I expect it to be. So I want to take a little bit, bit of a sidebar, and these are some of the challenges that I've found with automating Windows. If you're, you know, Chef or no Chef, right? 
regardless, if you're on this journey of trying to accelerate your business by automating Windows, there are some challenges um, on this platform. There's no real package manager. It's not like on if you've managed a Unix or Linux machine before. You know, if you're on Red Hat, you can just say yum install blah blah. Or if you're Debian, you can say apt get what you might call it. On Windows, there's not really a similar analog, right? So you've got definitely roles and features, but you can also install MSIs, Inno packages, right? Install Shield, a whole bunch of stuff, and then some vendors just give you a zip file to put on the system. You know, there's not really a unified interface for this. Um, folks out in the community are actually helping with this a lot. So there's Chocolatey, which is a project that Rob Reynolds in the community um, is working on, and that's an attempt to bring the same kind of maturity for package management to Windows. It's also the second problem, um, which, which I found is so many of the commercial off-the-shelf software vendors, especially for like large enterprise products, they don't really understand that, that users now want to automate things. So they expect to have a GUI, right? And actually Don Jones talked about this in, in that article that I, that I pulled the quote from before, where he was meeting with a vendor and the vendor showed him how much work they put into making a GUI for their products running on server core. He's like, you're, you know, you're doing it wrong. The purpose of server core is to not be running with a GUI, right? Um, and so there's, I, I've run into things where, you know, if you try to MSI exec something on Windows, it does weird things like pop up a dialog box that has no content in it, just an OK button. Um, so some vendors don't really understand that you want to just run things unattended, right? You want to install things with no human intervention. There's also weird desktop functions that get port that have been ported to the server OS, right? Like user access control, not really that useful on a server OS, right? Um, but it can often bite you if you're trying to download files or execute MSIs from the downloads directory, or it's not going to let you do that. And then there's also like Internet Explorer enhanced security, which you know I don't really think needs to be turned on on a server. Personally, it just kind of gets in the way. Like that, I can understand that maybe for a desktop, but for a server, it's not really that good. Um, things like WinRM. You know, when you're when you're doing a lot of automation, right? So whether you, again, whether you're using Chef or not, if you're using um, PowerShell, you can. The really great thing about PowerShell and part of the Monad manifesto that. Um, Jeff Snover wrote is that he thought of the ability to treat a remote computer the same as you're treating your local computer. So remoting in the Windows world is built right in. When you run PowerShell commands, you can you can run those commands um, against a remote machine and do all the authentication, the key exchange, the Kerberos, and all that stuff um, very very easily. But the problem is that there's quotas um, on the system that's under management, and sometimes in actually out of the box, those quotas are often set way, way too low. And those quotas are pertinent to things like how much CPU time a process can take up, um, how much memory a process can take. So you can imagine if you're installing soup to nuts, a large enterprise application is going to take you know 30 minutes end to end. So you might hit those quotas, right? And so the out of the box defaults need to be tuned. Um, there's also things like this Win32 redirector. Have you ever seen like SysNative or SysWow64 and all that kind of stuff in Windows? It's like how Windows emulates the system, 30, system and system 32 directories to 32-bit processes versus 64-bit processes. So you have to be care, cognizant and careful about where you're putting things on the system so that they, they work. Um, another inconsistency is there's not necessarily a good place, a unified place to store all settings on a Windows machine, right? You would think that the registry having been around for what, at this point, like 15, 20 years, that everybody would use that. But even Microsoft doesn't eat their own dog food. If you manage SQL Server before, a lot of SQL Server settings that go in I and I files, right, with, a, with their own special setting. Um, so just that's another thing to be cognizant of. Reboots are also a fact of life in Windows, right? So sometimes you need to take a reboot, and if you're trying to automate something end to end, you might have to take more than one reboot, right? So that can be somewhat impacting in terms of the speed and that you're able to, to automate a Windows platform. Um, and then there's also, I listed a bunch of other uh, knowledge base articles up here, patches and things like that, that if you're actually embarking on this journey, it's useful to know that there's some weird quirks and bugs and things like that in Windows. Um, these three are um, like MSUs. If you're installing MSUs, you actually can't install MSUs over WinRM. You have to unpack them into their cabs and install the cabs individually, which is kind of a pain. Um, there's also some broken patches sometimes to that prevent MSIs from installing properly. That's what the second one is. And then the third one is that in some of the older OSs, I think 2012 and below, the WinRM quotas, um, even if you change them, they're still not respected The new um, without a hotfix. The new, the new limits aren't, aren't respected. So you've got to apply a hotfix before you actually start automating or you're going to tear your hair out. Okay, so finally I want to talk about uh, desired state configuration. What's all, this, what's all this about, right? And this is what folks in the sort of leading edge parts of Microsoft are calling it the future of automation on Windows. 
So desired state configuration is part of PowerShell uh, WMF4.0 and up. And it's the future of automation because it's kind of like Chef in that you write policy documents. Um, it's, a, it's a significant break in administration because like no longer are you being asked as an administrator, as a developer, to actually configure anything by typing imperative com commands into the system. Um, DSC asks administrators to simply describe how they want that system state to look. And the, the system, the DSC framework, configures that computer accordingly. Um, and you can look at this book if you want a quick introduction to DSC. Um, Steve Morosky works for Chef now, um, but it's a really great book. It's only about 25 or 30 pages long. It gives you a really quick intro to DSC. So you might think, well, is this a competitor to Chef? Like, what are the, or what's the, what's the positioning and whatever? So you can kind of think of, and Jeffrey Snover has said this before, is DSC is fundamentally a framework, right? So you've got, the, the analog is like Perfmon. Think about Perfmon when you're, when you're on Windows, right? So if you want to look at how a system is performing on a Windows machine interactively, you might open up Perfmon and look at all the graphs, CPU utilization and memory and all this stuff. But you would never actually think of using Perfmon as your only monitoring and performance management solution across the board, right? So you might use, and I'm not as familiar, honestly, with the space on, in the Windows side, but like a SolarWinds or something like that, you might use that as sort of an enterprise dashboard or, uh, to look at how your, how your fleet is performing across the board. So that's kind of the analog. It's Perfmon is to SolarWinds, DSC is to Chef. So DSC provides that base layer of automation primitives that Chef recipes can, can then call. But DSC is deliberately, and it is not designed to have the entire ecosystem around declarative configuration management. Um, it doesn't have a server, right? So there's, it, does, it doesn't have the content distribution problem solved. It has not, it's not intended to solve that problem. Uh, it doesn't have cross-platform support yet. It is not a priority to have that in, in DSC. It also doesn't have you know, monitoring, logging, analytics, like all this other stuff that, that we have in declarative configuration management tools like Chef. However, the benefit is that it brings a standard base for automation to Windows. And Microsoft has said, to their internal developers, to all application developers. Going forward, if you want to ship a product for the targeting the server platform, you have to have some DSC integration. You have to have some way that your system, that system administrators who are buying the Microsoft products are going to uh, be able to automate the, those applications um, with DSC. And I think the other thing is that because Microsoft is, well, it's like a 100 pound gorilla, right? Um, so this will trickle down to, again, those recalcitrant COTS vendors that haven't provided ways for administrators to, to automate stuff, right? So it's going to, you know, Microsoft is at, maybe at some point is going to force those vendors to provide DSC automation hooks as well. So it's a, it's a common language and that's good for everyone. So example DSC code, just expanding a little bit on that example that I showed before, is here's how you might start writing a configuration to configure that fourth coffee website that I was talking about, right? So um, you're, again, you're writing a policy document that simply says I'd like IIS to be installed, to be present and then install an ASP 4.5 role. And then, of course, there's not enough room for me to, if I put the whole thing on here, it'd be like nine point type and I wouldn't be able to read it, but there's obviously a lot more directives down here um, to actually. Screen. Screen. I know, right? If, I guess if I put eight point text, it would still be like bigger than my head. And so here's how you would invoke that from Chef. So we've got a really good integration with DSC and it allows you to, to mix, like the good thing about um, Chef is there's a lot of content out there that people have already used even predating DSC to automate a Windows platform. So you can mix and match a lot of these primitives, right? Um, so you can mix and match standing up your web server here, but you can then use native Chef features to, for example, get content, get your application, drop it on there, install it, whatever. It's up to you. Um, but the syntax, as you can see, maps across that, across that boundary. All right, so Sort of a last, last thing that I wanted to show is all this is in the service of, so what we've, what we've talked about in the last half hour, however, however long I've been standing up here, um, is we've been talking about infrastructure as code. And is it really code? Is it really a program? Yeah, I guess it is a program. It's more of a, a state declaration. But even still, it is still code that you're, that you're executing um, and that you're running to configure your production system. So you want to avoid breaking that, right? So you can think of if you're an application developer, you have tests to uh, make sure that you don't, you don't break the world when you make changes, right? So similarly, this is actually even more important, more critical when you're configuring infrastructure. Because hey, if you break one application, that costs your company a lot of money, but that's one application. 
with automation of infrastructure, you could conceivably break all the things in your entire enterprise, right? So that's what I say that, you know, to, uh, to really to screw things up requires a sysadmin. To really screw things up requires automation. So this is what I say when I talk about, you know, DevOps is a two-way street. So DevOps, like folks will often say, like, operations folks will often say, well, you know, it's really great when developers are actually caring about their about the applications that they're running. They, they, you know, we're going to make them take responsibility for their applications, for their uptime, for their scaling, for their deployment. So that's great. We'll like give them all cell phones and we'll put them all on call, right? That'll solve this problem. But it's a two-way street. I tell operations people all the time, right? So sysadmins are what we call like infracoders in this world. You're not really a sysadmin, like a pointy clicky GUI kind of sysadmin. You're an infrastructure coder now. Um, also have a lot to learn from developers. And I actually started out as a software developer. I'm writing Java in like 1990, 1997 or so. And back then you didn't have any of this. Like we wrote no unit tests. We wrote no acceptance tests. We just pounded out a bunch of Java and shipped it, right? And if it broke, oh well, I guess we just like make the change and ship it again. And over time, software developers realize like, that's really inefficient and it costs the company a lot of money and then they get paged and you know, like everybody's sad. So good developers today, uh, if you're writing software, they write unit tests, they write acceptance tests, they maybe they practice test-driven development, they write the test first, um, so they, they state their target, con target conditions and then they actually write the code to go along with that. And the whole point is to build confidence in your program code, making sure that it's not only working correctly today, but if you go and change it in the future, or you refactor or whatever, it's still got the desired state that you want. So the objective is to avoid breaking the world, right, when you deploy. You've, you've done at least some testing um, up front. And so the same thing for infra infrastructure coders, infra coders, right? We should be doing all of those exact same things so we can avoid breaking like the entire world, like our entire enterprise. So the good thing is that you know one of the one of the real benefits of uh, the chef chef being an open source project and having a very rich community is there's a lot of ecosystem tools out there to interact with chef. People write things for their use cases all the time. One of the most valuable ones is this tool called Test Kitchen, which basically allows you to spin up a virtual machine. I mean, that could be on your desktop, right? So I personally use VirtualBox or VMware Fusion, but this could be a VM in Azure, could be a Hyper-V VM. It's just a throwaway test bed. Right? that resembles um, a bare machine like you would deploy in production. It's an environment for you to test, this, test these changes uh, before you actually go and deploy to production. And the really valuable thing about Test Kitchen is not all that mechanical execution of like actually bringing up the machine and executing your cookbooks and all that. It's the fact that it's got, in, it's got an integration with acceptance tests. Right? So after you do all the provisioning and you bring up that fourth coffee website, you can then make declarative assertions about how that system is supposed to look. Right outside of the context of Chef or outside of the context of DSC or anything like that. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a couple of different tools. One of the most popular ones is called ServerSpec uh, because it follows, uh, a, it is built on top of a Ruby tool called RSpec, which allows you, this, uh, allows you to write almost plain English statements about what, the, what your system is supposed to look like, right? So you can read this. Um, this is an example of a ServerSpec script for this fourth coffee website. And so you can read this and, and see what this thing is supposed to do, right? Even if, you, even if you're configuring this with some other mechanism or whatever, you could conceivably run the server spec against any other system in your infrastructure to see if it passes those tests, right? Um, so, you know, I should have an IIS web server installed on the system, right? There should be something like listing on port 80. Um, I should have a default homepage for my fourth coffee website in my INET pub directory, and it should be a file, it shouldn't be a directory, right? These are pretty elementary tests that I wrote here just for the purposes of this demo, but you could, um, you could write more sophisticated tests, right? Not only like connect to port 80 and make sure that I actually have that website that's fourth coffee, it's not the default website that comes with IIS, for example. So I was also gonna run this demo, but then I realized it takes about 20 minutes to fire up Windows on a machine and do all this stuff. So again, I took a couple of screen captures um, and so you have this test kitchen program, which is uh, invoked with the kitchen command, and you simply say uh, kitchen test, and then the test suite that you want to execute. So I happen to have a Windows 2012 R2 uh, image on my machine, and it, you know it just basically asks Vagrant to bring up that bring up that box, and then starts provisioning it. Right, so uploads all the cookbooks, the fourth coffee cookbook, and all this to the machine, and then just runs Chef and blah blah. It runs Chef, and I've elided all the output from Chef. At the end of the chef run, which happens in about you know under two minutes, um, and you can see that test kitchen takes over again, 
and it goes ahead and runs all my post install tests, right? Starting to run my server spec test test suite. So it's running through, and as you can see, my three my three tests passed, right? It successfully worked, and so I'm done. And then it will what, what it'll do? It'll just kill that VM. Or I pass destroy equals never, so that it doesn't kill it. But conceivably, you could uh, you could just kill it after it's done. So this gives you really fast feedback before you actually go to production and try to do things um, in your infrastructure. So just to sum up all the things that I talked about here, I know that's a lot of, lot of content. It's a, uh, kind of like a survey course of the world of automation on Windows. Um, but the points I wanted you to take home today, um, get away from the point and click mechanism of administering Windows, right? That will eventually go away. You will see, or Microsoft will probably make it go away at some point, like maybe someday. Um, when you install Windows, all you get is server core, right? So or is it going to be called Windows anymore? Probably not. I don't know. It doesn't really make, make much sense, right? Um, learning PowerShell. Microsoft is definitely pushing folks to learn PowerShell. And there's lots of courses and tutorials and information online to learn PowerShell. Steve teaches a class, uh, PowerShell Fundamentals, as well. Um, I think he's teaching, if anybody's going to Lisa this year, I think he's teaching that class there as well. Declarative configuration management, whether you're using Chef or DSC or anything else, right? It's the way that you can really, um, it, it's, it's the way that the world is going in terms of like changing your job as a sysadmin from being very imperative to being declarative. So it's important to pick a framework and, and learn it. And then the other thing is that once you learn that, it's a journey, right? At the end of that journey, you'll also be testing your infrastructure code, and, and I highly recommend that to avoid, to avoid breaking production before you actually go to prod. So that's all I have. Uh, happy to take any questions from the folks. Yes, Bridget. I have a question about the demo made at the beginning with the different things I can do on it. I have a really small issue. Is the thing that takes 10 minutes like getting Azure to do things? Because like when I use AWS and Demo Knight, I use stuff all the time. Um, you know, to tell Chef to configure a server from scratch. I don't remember it taking that long. Is that a complication for us when we're using? No, Azure is a little bit slower. It also depends on the time of day, I find, and also the type of machine that you're asking for, right? Especially when I used a medium machine before, it took longer than when I was using a small machine, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, so Windows is, Windows is also much slower than it was before. Like, much slower. I was spinning up Windows machines. I was actually surprised last week I was spinning up Windows machines as small as well. Windows and Azure and stuff like that. And it took like five minutes. So, that's phenomenal. It was pretty phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I just spun up the machine. Yeah. Like, I wasn't doing anything after that. On the AWS, it's probably like five to ten seconds at least. Yeah. And the reason it takes longer for larger machine sizes is because of the way that the machine looks. It's a lot easier for, for whatever reason, for Azure to go from all the machine space on the smaller side and then all the machine space on the larger side. And then the larger side is bigger than the smaller side. Right. So that's something that's really cool. Right. So how long did that shelf run for you? Um, it, it used to be very small. Not that long, a few minutes from scratch. So yeah. more like months. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure. So the, every resource in Chef, like the built in ones, they have some kind of test operation. So they load a routine that basically checks to see whether, whether that thing is already in that state. So you can think of like Windows Package, for example, which is a built in primitive. So if you say Windows Package, you know, Firefox, whatever. You specify the package name. So what it actually does in the background is it checks, it makes a Win32 API call to see if there's a package that's already called Firefox install. And if it if there isn't, if there is, then it just skips over it. What other questions can I answer? Yes, sir. No, what it does is, so as I mentioned, it maps, like Chef maps any DSC. Uh, let me go back to that slide. Right now, it's still, right now we're still testing it out. So there's a cookbook called DSC. Um, and the purpose of that cookbook is to map the DSC syntax into Chef syntax transparently without you having to intervene. So the other good thing, I didn't mention, DSC is one of those another one of those products that Microsoft is releasing a lot more frequently. So if you've looked into it a little bit, they're they're releasing what they're calling waves, so a bunch of zip files of DSC resources like pretty frequently, probably like every quarter or so. Um, and so you're getting more and more functionality in DSC uh, with every quarter. 
and those, those resources will be transparently available uh, through Chef as a result of this mapping. Yes, sir. Licensing. Well, I don't have to worry about licensing because I don't run real production workloads. But yeah, there are some there are some issues with that. Like an example is um, like that's germane to what actually hits me is like test instances, right? Like that test kitchen box that I showed you before is unclear the licensing policy uh, behind those boxes, right? I mean, we have MSDN, so we just I just put in a real license key. But it's like, are those actually accounted for as real seats if you left them running for a long time? On um, the other area that. Um, licensing actually does hit you, is to Bridget's point, um, about provisioning time for these machines, right? The reason it even takes, even in EC2, when it takes a, num uh, you know, a few minutes to spin up a Windows box, is because it's doing a bunch of sysprep stuff and licensing, like license activation against a special license activation server in, in EC2 to do that, do that stuff. So, um, yeah, it is, a, it is a bit of a challenge. Like policy-wise, like I think, I think the technology has gotten a little bit of a, ahead of where Microsoft's traditional licensing uh, paradigm is in terms of like fixed bare metal machines that have a long lifespan. I personally think it would be great. Um, maybe Satya will take me up on this. We'll see. But um, you know, if, if Microsoft could just give away their OS, you know, like and make and and because the, the value proposition is not really in the bare operating system anymore, right? It's in all the value adds on top of that. Right? So maybe 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 someday they'll just do that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. But it would definitely pivot them, and they get, they would get an incredible amount of press for it. Yes, sir. Um, how does this map with like? Can you describe like cache baseline results? Like, if you spin up a machine and do a test in Windows, can you have a cache baseline like table that that meets? Is that something that's a, a tool for this mechanism, or do we have to call that problem? Yeah, patch management is a discussion that I could spend probably another hour talking about. Um, what what people often do is they just respin their images because um, it's not a technical problem. It's just a, if you were to start with a let's say you were to start with a generic 2012 R2 image without update, right? Like the one from October, you probably spend like 30 minutes patching the box before it actually does anything and rebooting it five times. Um, and if you're trying to be dynamic and responsive, right, you want to like minimize that as much as possible. Yeah, I'd like to. Right. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Regarding the screen of labs that are possible in the theoretical future of like the paper and the lab, um, do they, are they just hoping that uh, widespread adoption in large enterprise will save them forever from the Yeah, I think. I think there's so there's kind of two answers to that. One is yes, they have a deploy base, and even if Microsoft did nothing, they could make money off that deploy base for the next ten or fifteen years, right? They may not grow, but they still, you know, it's a, it's a money factor for them. For them, it's a question at this point of like, how do you actually re re remain relevant? How do you actually continue to grow the business? So you can see that there's definitely two or more factions within Microsoft. Like you've, you know, and it's really interesting because Jeffrey Snover is actually the head, um, the technical head of both the Windows Server business and a lot of this PowerShell stuff. And you can kind of see, so he's responsible both for, for DSC and SCCM with two completely different approaches to the same problem, right? So it'll be interesting to see how within Microsoft they, they resolve this dichotomy, right? And I think we've been, we've been seeing a lot of changes actually with, with Satya becoming CEO, right? But the notion that we could have uh, Mark Rusinovich, who um, you know is now, I guess, CTO of the Azure business, I believe. Um, and he was on stage at ChefConf last year giving a talk about Azure. And the demo that he showed was demonstrating a Linux box running on Azure. And I think he was using Mongo or Redis or something like that as a demonstration use case for it. Completely inconceivable to those folks who have worked with Microsoft and like even five years ago, right? So they're kind of realizing that there's certain areas in which, you know, it's not worth it to, to try to jam people into like a pure Microsoft model, right? It's a commodity, right? Computers are a commodity and they're realizing that on the Azure side. And on the operating system side, right, that's what I mean about like if 
given the way the OS would be the, the ultimate validation of this, like it's not about the operating system anymore, right? It's about the value, the value proposition on top of it. Right. Right. Right, I mean the story that Microsoft is trying to tell with Azure, I'm primarily with like, the, I'm not a developer, definitely not a .NET developer, but they have really good integration with Visual Studio, right? So they make it super easy for you as a developer to just run your workload on Azure. So the natural conclusion of that, you're absolutely right, would be, well, you know, if I'm not really paying, if I'm, if I'm not really paying like the per year ELA kind of license fees for my operating systems in the cloud on Azure, I'm just paying for them like as I need them. Then why am I, why do I have this other cost model over here? Right, if the whole objective and the vision is to be like completely, you know, independent of whatever your whatever your deployment environment is. If you want to run Metal, if you want to run Azure, you know, like if you if you were at TechEd last year, right, they had a slide up there being like, you can run your workload wherever. Then they should figure out a way. They probably will figure out a way to make all the stories around that in terms of licensing and um, consistent across all the different platforms. Right, yeah, and Azure is, you know, they're still trying to throw off a uh, little bit of the chains of the PaaS implementation originally, right? So some of the terminology is still a little bit weird, but it's, you know, never underestimate the power of like a whole fleet of Microsoft developers being able to like accelerate your, accelerate the development of all the, all the primitives and things like that in Azure. Yeah, yeah no worries. Are there any other questions? You can also speak to me, you know, I'll be around in the hall for a lunch or whatever, but thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.